seatbelts, everyone! You're in for a Magic School Bus Marathon! Ms. Frizzle ranks up there with Bill Nye as a poster child for making learning fun. Microsoft brought in Music Pen to develop a series of games based on the PBS show, which itself was based on a series of books. Astronomy, Biology, Oceanography, Geology, Paleontology, there's a bunch of these. In the spirit of the toy box, I'm just gonna focus on the ones I grew up with, covering them in order of release and see how they evolved. Let's start with the Solar System. Released in 1994, this was the first of the series. There's a very jarring change compared to the show. Liz talks. What a ride! But so, what's new? Other than this introduction, she's mainly there to nudge you along by encouraging you to click around or give instructions where needed. She's not wrong about clicking around. There's a bunch of things to find just from clicking around the classroom. This gives me vibes of moving my mouse around the screen looking for Easter eggs and all those strong bad email episodes. But there are no contextual clues here. Just stuff lying around waiting to be clicked as you jive to this nice, jazzy melody. Even the lockers and cabinets have something going on. Well, most of them. You don't really get this kind of interactivity in the post-Flash era. I miss that. And if you click on the globe, you're taken to this screen. Each of these strange planets has... uh... Well, just see for yourself. Uh, what is... Why is... Once you're done with that fever dream, you can also check out everyone's reports to learn more about the day's subject matter. Every installment has these, and even Ms. Frizzle wrote a report this time around. Now, if you're not familiar with Magic School Bus, Ms. Frizzle loves taking her class on field trips. And they're a diverse bunch. The research-obsessed Dorothy Ann, the artistically inclined Tim, the wisecracking Carlos, the timid Arnold, and the thoroughly unlikable Janet, who we never see again in the rest of these games. To my memory, she only ever appeared sporadically in the TV show, and I didn't exactly miss her in the other games. Anyway, when I say Ms. Frizzle likes field trips, she likes to go big and won't even entertain going home, much to Arnold's chronic chagrin. Even the prospect of going to the planetarium is too much for that stick in the mud. Watch a film strip instead? Come on, kid, where's your sense of adventure? But, Ms. Frizzle has better plans. In her mind, there is no planetarium better than the solar system itself. So off we go! But things go wrong out there, and the bus loses control after getting struck by a meteoroid. When the chaos dies down, the class is short one teacher. I've got a bad feeling about this. Well, where's the phrase? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Turns out, she slipped out amidst the chaos to challenge the class to a galaxy-wide game of hide-and-seek. And with that, class is in session. The only way to find the frizz is to learn about the solar system. Now you're in the driver's seat, figuratively and literally. Pick a destination, and there you'll go. Each planet has a neat little cinematic for landing on it or setting up shop on one of its moons. It's kind of impressive for its time, all things considered. On each planet, a few of the students will have a little something to say. It may be interesting facts, or it may be another gag, especially if it's Carlos. Or it's a gag that teaches you an interesting fact. Sometimes during the year, she appears as the morning star, the last star you see in the morning. And sometimes she appears as the evening star, the first star you see at night. Clicking elsewhere, your results will vary. There's a science experiment on each planet and moon for you to do, giving you a nice hands-on experience to learn their ins and outs. How fast is Mercury compared to Earth? How do greenhouse gases impact the absorption and retention of heat on Venus? How does gravitational pull affect orbit? How many Plutos can you fit inside Jupiter? Did I really just say that out loud? These are really neat. Even nowadays I can have a good time messing around with these. I love this kind of interactivity in my learning. But that leaves one important question. How do you progress? Well, for that, you need tokens. 
to get tokens, you need to click the what's it. Yeah, Liz calls it a what's it. And play a short 2D platformer. Every planet and moon has one, and you play as whoever did their report on it. They have different layouts, different gravity, and different gimmicks. Hell, Neptune has you straight up falling through Neptune's gaseous body before picking up a jetpack to return to the top. Nice twist. Your lives are infinite, but your patience may not be. Neither is your oxygen supply. If you run out of oxygen or fall off the level, Liz retrieves you and puts you back at the start. That gets tricky when you realize the jetpack, fun as it is, drains your oxygen super fast. But you can usually grab more oxygen tanks to stay alive longer, and these levels are mercifully short. If you grab the token, you can go back to the bus and put it in the frizz finder, or store it in the glove compartment. This frizzle will give you up to three clues, and the third one is generally obvious enough to be a dead giveaway. Get it wrong, and the frizz finder closes, requiring another token to open it. Get it right, and Ms. Frizzle reveals herself, and you go home. Well, technically you can go back to Earth from the get-go, but until you find her, there's no real point. If you do find her and go for another round, she'll pick another hiding spot so you can play again. I had fun playing this back in the day, and I learned a good bit about the solar system from it, but it does beg the question, what does 2D platforming have to do with space? Your knowledge of space won't do you any good if you can't get those tokens in the platforming sections. This is what we in the business call fake difficulty. Differing levels of gravity or the slippery platforms on the chunks that make up Saturn's rings may be tangentially related to the subject matter, but you don't come to an educational game about space travel for platforming puzzles. This isn't to say they're hard. Unresponsive as the jumping controls are, I'm fully prepared to chalk up a lot of my failure to skill issue. But it does feel rather out of place given the broader context of the game. Most of the game has you doing experiments and learning about the planets while applying that knowledge to the clues. I was not aware that the features of Venus were named for famous women until replaying this game. I learned something. But getting tokens, which are required for progression, is locked behind almost entirely unrelated gameplay. It's a weird design decision, but it didn't stop me from having a good time doing those platformers back then. Well, not all of them, since I found some of them more frustrating than others, like Venus and Saturn. But I wasn't exactly learning anything from them. That wasn't something I even really thought of back then. I mainly chalked that up to the games appealing to my short attention span. Well, I wasn't the only one learning from these games. I think the developers took notes on how to improve the experiences they made them as is evident in the next release. Time for biology. Explores the human body gives us a new variation on the classroom, with new interactions to mess around with. Some can even respond to and interact with each other. But among the most memorable is the goldfish. Click him, and he jumps out of the bowl. Click him while he's hovering in the air, and he falls to the ground. Drop him in the volcano, and he gets blasted out and lands back in the bowl. But if you leave him there, Oh god, that's grim. He'll spring back to life if you put him back in the fishbowl, but if you put him in the volcano... Did you have pitch black comedy on your magic school bus bingo card? After clicking the shoes to go to the other side of the classroom, Ms. Frizzle makes her grand entrance and introduces the day's topic. But before you start, you set up your driver's license. And let me tell you, someone had a lot of fun recording these sounds. Well, Arnold finally got his wish to skip out on the field trip, because this time, he is the field trip. Your goal is simple. Visit each organ on the syllabus and find a way out. That's already a step in the right direction. You can be bad at video games and still beat this game. The only problem is there's no real need to explore anything, which means you learn what each of the organs are and that's about it really. I think they knew as much because once you do clear everything, Liz encourages you to go back in and click around a bit. So naturally, as a kid, I got a little miff when she said that, even though I was convinced I saw everything there was to see. I distinctly remember going back through a second time, only for her to say the exact same thing after I'd clicked around a bunch. 
She'll say it either way, it doesn't matter. Of course, all this is assuming you even know that's what the goal is, which isn't immediately obvious unless you talk to Liz enough times. Maybe the instructions are in the manual that I lost. Like before, every transition has a little CG animation to accompany it, which encouraged me to only use the central nervous system fast travel when I needed to. From here on out in these games, just about every location is linked up, making exploration more organic. No pun intended. Sometimes it's a little arbitrary, particularly in the later games, but it all mostly makes sense here. From the mouth, you can go to the nose of the esophagus. The esophagus links to the stomach, naturally. From the stomach, you can go to the intestines. You can chart a whole map through Arnold's body without retreading on a single organ, only using the central nervous system in the brain, where you have no other options. There are mini games themed around each organ, but unlike Solar System, you don't have to play them to advance. They're just there for fun, and for bragging rights. And they are fun. Liver Lever was particularly addicting for me back in the day. And once again, the composer goes all out. Though I suspect he might have done so in MIDI format, so I experienced some auditory oddities while running this on my virtual machine. Some of the games are fun demonstrations of the organ's functionality, and some are a complete waste of time. The science experiments are back, but Liz only offers instructions and context if prompted. I respect that hands-off approach, letting you figure things out on your own if you want. But Liz can help you make sense of what's actually going on if you're still confused or just want to learn more. She's ready and willing to explain just how important the liver is to the human body. Otherwise, the experiments frequently speak for themselves. If that wasn't enough, you even get a gizmo that lets you check on Arnold and manipulate his behavior a bit. Wait, when did we install these cameras? Another first for the series is access to the back of the bus, where you can hang out with the whole class, sans Arnold. Even Ms. Frizzle's back there, further cementing the autonomy she's giving you. The class will offer jokes and reports, and Tim will show you what he's drawing in a sketchbook. Ugh! Someone did not have a good time at the dentist! You can make your own art, too, in this bizarre little activity. Well, art in the sense that it's about as endearing as fine art these days. Who am I kidding? That's an insult to the potential here. It's not even pretending to be sophisticated. The whole point is to make a mess. The soundtrack and array of grotesque sound effects reinforce as much. If you quit the game, Liz shows and comments on your progress before seeing you off. But the proper ending unlocks once you visit all the organs on the list. Not every organ is included for... obvious reasons. They were only willing to go so far in covering waste processing, and under the circumstances and given the demographic, reproductive organs were a Big no-no. You have three options for leaving Arnold's body. Through the mouth, by way of dropping a hot pepper on his tongue to spit you out. Through the nose, by way of a feather to make him sneeze you out. Or through the skin, by way of cranking up his thermostat and making him sweat you off. Other exits were off the table for understandable reasons. When all's said and done, it's back to the classroom, and you're encouraged to go for another round if you're so inclined. Particularly to try to catch anything you missed the first time, but this isn't a long play. That's for another time. In the end, Human Body addressed and fixed some of the issues in Solar System. It's supposed to be educational. Discount Super Mario Brothers in the middle of learning about our Solar System isn't what I'd call educational. It's a fun idea, but it shouldn't be required to progress. Some of the minigames are cleverly themed around the functions of the organs, and others, not so much. I'll just say it, these puzzles are lame and a complete cop-out. They're just filler. But at least they break up the monotony if you want a fun little distraction. There's nothing wrong with that. Lord knows I needed occasional distractions and breaks while writing this script. But they overcorrected on progression since you can just visit every organ and call it a day. Only a few organs allow exploration outside the bus, and there isn't much point to it. There's just these little tidbits you can play around with and they don't really do much other than add to the silliness. You don't learn anything. The real meat is in the factoids, student reports, and experiments. Maybe they're just relying on the innate curiosity of the kids playing. I mean, I know I did a lot of poking around back then, so maybe they were onto something. Application of that knowledge, though, isn't really needed. 
Unless you're like me back in the day, insistent on not using the central nervous system at all if I can help it. Probably because I didn't even know how to use it back then. It's very trusting of you as a player to just learn on your own terms. As someone whose school experience never really resonated with him nearly as much as these games did, I respect that. But it's a bit of a flawed approach. Still, they found a way to improve the experience going forward. Magic School Bus Explores the Ocean is one of my favorites from this series, and it played a big part in my love of the sea and its inhabitants. There is no classroom hub this time. Instead, you start at the beach. Now let's hit the beach! Don't have to tell me twice, sister. The beach is a great place to start since it's a natural gateway to the ocean with its own ecosystem and everything. The beach stays relevant as a location even after your journey begins, but there's a few diversions here as well. There's a rather clunky but still charming sandcastle builder, a minigame where you play as a crab scrounging for food while hiding from seagulls and herring, and litter. This game is a little preachy and ham-fisted on its environmentalist propaganda, but it's propaganda that unfortunately remains relevant three decades since its release. I mean, look at this. Some careless jackass even threw a bottle in the water. Liz, care to do the honors? Ten points. Attention, everyone. It seems like we have a treasure to find. Oh, a treasure map. So this is your motivation for exploring the ocean. Learn about the ocean and use your knowledge to solve each clue. Get all the clues and you can go find the treasure wherever it resides. To that end, you'll be exploring a tide pool, the open ocean, a kelp forest, the deep ocean, a deep sea vent, a coral reef, and even the beach. Yeah, a couple clues can be found on the beach, so it's not just a starter hub. Of course, you may wonder what's stopping you from ignoring the treasure map at the start and just exploring of your own volition. Well, nothing. You want to start exploring? Go right ahead. Right after you make your driver's license, of course. But even then, the game doesn't stop you from just going right into the ocean. It's just that next time you go on the bus, you'll be prompted to make your license. Once that's done, you can explore right away. Treasure map be damned. I know this because I did it all the time as a kid. I didn't even need the motivation of a treasure map. I just wanted to go exploring right away. So I did. That alone gives me a lot of respect for this game. You could just get right into the action without worrying about an objective if you want. From the beach, you can jump straight into the nearby tide pool or explore the open ocean. Or you can hop on the bus to fast travel to whatever location you want. I love this. I spent so much time as a kid just exploring and learning about the ocean, playing the games, doing the experiments, looking through the reports, all to the tune of a gorgeous soundtrack. They really capture the ethereal nature of the ocean in this music. If there was ever a way to cure your thalassophobia, this would be it. Hands down, my favorite has to be this one. Man, that is soothing. Even better, you can listen to them with some neat visuals thanks to Kelp TV if you visit the Kelp Forest. Yeah, there's a ton to play with in this game. Even in the driver's seat you got all kinds of fun stuff. Whale watching, fun facts, the sounds of the sea, and that's to say nothing of the experiments, the mini-games, oh my god, so many memories. Oh yeah, and fish cards. Those were a thing that existed. And I still retained a lot of the lessons from it. Sea turtles are still reptiles, so they have to come to the surface to breathe. Kelp plants thrive in cold waters with rocky ocean floors and gentle wave action. Tides are the result of the moon pushing and pulling on the ocean. Christmas tree worms exist. And they're not even the weirdest sea creatures I've ever seen. So I give this game full marks for piquing my curiosity since I love aquariums and the ocean to this day. I'm probably biased because of the fond memories. I know Peanut Butter Gamer looked at this and Human Body in his Goodwill Games series and, understandably, wasn't especially kind to them. Well, at least he got them at a bargain. My mom tells me these games were not cheap when they came out. But his series is centered around short-form comedy, whereas I'm here to filibuster the hell out of you about games from my childhood, so... Back to my blathering. 
They stepped up their game with the reports, providing photos and short videos to accompany the dialogue. Even though my short attention span meant I would pay more attention to the videos and animated bits than the photos, and I didn't really retain that much. That's on me, though. I was a slow learner. I don't regret the time I spent on this game. Even if the clues occasionally stumped me, and the payoff of the treasure is laughably weak, considering all the build-up. Oh well. I was never in it for the treasure anyway. It was about the journey for me, not the destination. Some things never change. But Tim's voice sure did. You can see that they're really made of dust and rocks and ice. Daisy Brittle Stars can cast off an arm seized by a predator. While their pro-environmental message isn't what I'd call subtle, if anything I'd call it preachy as all hell, and even a little grating sometimes if I'm being honest, I can't really fault them for encouraging kids to fight the good fight, especially since it's a fight we're still fighting to this very day. But that soapbox is a little crowded, so I'll just step aside and cheer those people on while we move on to the next game. Well, I'm not done gushing, because Inside the Earth, along with Ocean, is my all-time favorite from this series. This is the game that kickstarted my love of geology, which persists to this day. Right off the bat, we get our motivation for the field trip. Arnold's missing a few samples from his laughably small rock and mineral collection. Seriously, 16 samples? <laughs> Amateur. Anyone else would just swing on by the next rock and mineral show in their area, but we know that is not how the day's going down. Once we finish fiddling around in the classroom and admire the photos on the wall, it's time to set up our license and hit the road. Or rather, the earth. Where we're going, we don't need roads. And among the first things you may notice is that, while she never spoke last time, Click on the gear shift to find out where this bus can take us. Liz has a new voice. This is the last time we'll hear Liz properly speak in a game. And instead of Katherine Thompson, she's voiced by, apparently, Whoopi Goldberg. That's a bizarre change. Well, never mind that. Let's get started. You have a nice little selection of locations to visit. A canyon, a geode, some undersea points of interest, a volcano, cavern, and a fault line. You can see the sights and learn about the inner workings of our planet, play games themed around each locale, and search for samples to restore Arnold's collection. Conveniently, Arnold is missing one sample from each category. A mineral, an igneous rock, a sedimentary rock, and a metamorphic rock. There's only a handful of samples from each category, probably for the sake of keeping it simple, but even with such a small selection, getting the right samples to turn up can be a pain in the ass. You can, and often will, find duplicates. That's not unrealistic, but it is annoying. Some of them can be cooked up in the Earth Kitchen, assuming you have the right ingredients. Some can be found by digging for junk with the Retriever Arm and putting in the Rock Transformer. Many of them can only be found in the field. In lieu of dedicated science activities, your experimenting is done in your search for samples at the Geode Table, Earth Kitchen, and Rock Transformer. The Geode Table is where you take samples you found in the wild. Arnold will walk you through the process of washing them, analyzing them, and running tests to identify them. Minerals are identified through a streak test and a hardness test. Rocks are first narrowed down to igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic based on their composition. Igneous rocks are identified by their hue and size of their crystals. Sedimentary rocks are identified by cracking them open and inspecting the grain size, though the vinegar test should come first to rule out limestone. Metamorphic rocks? Well, they oversimplify it here because there are more metamorphic rocks beyond slate, schist, and gneiss, but there are other ways of obtaining hard coal, quartzite, and marble in this game. Things are simplified a little bit, but I can confirm that these are all real methods of identifying samples. That's a nice little quartz crystal we got here. Why don't we just scrap some bejesus out of this thing with a nail? <laughs> yeah, you can stop cringing now. Nothing happened. You need more than a nail to scratch quartz. The reports are back as well, and they're as neat and informative as ever. I will never tire of seeing volcanic eruptions, even at a low resolution like this. And speaking of volcanoes... What, you thought it wasn't going to show this thing erupting? Check it out. I'm not going to lie. This is pretty damn visceral for a kid's edutainment game. And then, convection schmenvection. Let's step back outside and get a better look. 
Whoops, Liz just got cut off by a lava flow. I guess she's gonna have problems getting back to the bus. As you know. But I will say, her attempt to roast a marshmallow over the lava is a pretty accurate depiction. Careful, we shouldn't even be alive standing this close to a lava flow or breathing in the noxious volcanic gases. But Magic School Bus is all about suspension of disbelief. And if that weren't enough, why don't we just fly right into the volcano itself? In the middle of an eruption. I feel like this was supposed to be the lead-up to the eruption, not something you could do during the eruption itself. The air conditioning in the bus must be working overtime since we can hold down a casual conversation while floating on the magma. The bus should actually be sitting on top of it, realistically. While magma and lava are liquids, it's still molten rock, which is as dense as that implies. Still, Magic School Bus has higher educational standards than Minecraft, even Education Edition. The process of obsidian formation is grossly oversimplified to hell and back in Minecraft, but I think it's common knowledge by now that the game zigzags in terms of geological realism. Does this look sturdy to you? This is a hardness of 5.5 on Moe's scale, yet granite and andesite are easier to mine, despite being harder rocks. So Minecraft got it wrong. What else is new? The games and activities range from semi-educational to entertaining diversions. As before, they're entertaining, but unnecessary for progression. All that matters is replacing the missing samples in Arnold's collection. Once you do, you get a certificate you can print out, and then it's back to the classroom to start anew. Arnold's missing samples change with each playthrough, so there is some replay value here. Like the other games, this won't teach you everything there is to know about geology, and it even gets a few things wrong. Calcite's chemical composition is calcium, carbon, and 3 oxygen, not 2. Feldspar has 8 oxygen, not 2. Chalk and gypsum are not the same mineral. We don't use slate to make chalkboards anymore. And for reasons that weren't apparent at the time, we do not use talc for baby powder anymore. But if you're a young, aspiring geologist, it's a fun way to get your foot in the door. Nostalgia carried me hard on this one, given how many hours I dumped into this game, but I can't deny there were a few minor annoyances even back then. I have distinct memories of trying in vain to find Gabbro, an intrusive igneous rock which proved more elusive than it had any right to. Made worse by the fact that you can find sedimentary and metamorphic rocks where you would think you would only find igneous rocks. Still, this is arguably the finest example yet of forcing you to engage with the core educational aspects to progress. You're here to learn about geology, and if you set out to help Arnold, that's exactly what you'll do. Even if that means somehow turning this mess into a turkey dinner. Now that is one appetizing screw-up. I love their sense of humor. They don't let up on it when it comes to learning about paleontology. The classroom has all the interactivity you'd come to expect, accompanied by the same jaunty melody as last time. As for your motivation, Ms. Frizzle has an album of dinosaur photos to share. Or at least she would if the photos hadn't faded off. So what the hell are we supposed to do? Go back in time to the prehistoric age to get new photos? <laughs> As if. And with that, we go back in time to the prehistoric age so we can get new photos. You explore parts of the world as they were during the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous eras. Learn about the dinosaurs and use the clues from Ms. Frizzle to figure out what you need to photograph. So here's a question. What's stopping you from brute forcing it by photographing just about everything in sight? Uh, nothing. Besides your patience, that is, since that's kind of tedious and goes against the spirit of the game. And it's stupid. But if you're persistent with the clues, she just straight up tells you where to go to get the photo anyway. Perfect for kids like me who, again, had a very short attention span. Frankly, to this day, I still suspect undiagnosed ADHD. The reports are neat to go through, and as skippable as ever. They're just there if you want to learn more, but some of them could help with the clues. Same with the minigames. We got some decent variety for quick diversions in the middle of your quest, and they serve as another excuse for the developers to play up their sense of humor. Reassembling skeletons makes a comeback, but instead of the human body, it's dinosaur fossils. There's a dinosaur trivia board game for more of your educational fix, a game about the weird phonetics of dinosaur names, and a game where you defend your nest from egg thieves. Oh, you like eggs? Because you're about to get scrambled! And a game about literal hell raining down on you. 
So clearly, the safest thing to do is to climb up and get close to the source because you need that food, never mind all these meteors raining down on you. Because if you don't, you'll get swept away in the rising flood. The Stegosaur can tank a hit, but it moves slower. And the, uh, this thing moves faster, but dies in one hit. And when I say die, I mean die. I'm not kidding. For a kid's edutainment game, this is surprisingly violent. Holy shit! I came for photos and instead got death. A lot of death. This is straight up kid-friendly black comedy. And here you just get an Allosaur, eating its kill. Blood and everything. I'm almost surprised they missed an opportunity to preach about humanity creating its own mass extinction event. Maybe that would have been a little too much for the kids, but this game does feature blunt lessons about the food chain and Darwinism. They don't go full doomer on you, but at least they're honest about the life cycle and the balance of the ecosystem. They did the same thing in Explores the Ocean, after all. This was among the last games I played as a kid, and while it was a good enough time and I got a lot out of it, it wasn't necessarily my favorite. I don't know, I just didn't have the same insatiable fascination with dinosaurs as I did geology and the ocean. Dinosaurs are still cool, though. I have fond memories of going to see Walking with Dinosaurs live. Seeing those giant animatronic dinosaurs in person is firmly lodged in my memory. I very desperately want to do that again. That was about as close to living the game as I could ever hope to get. Compared to the game, memorable as it is, that's a tough act to follow. And that's about all I have to say about the Dinosaurs game. I'm at the point where I can't really say much about these games without repeating myself. But there's still a few memories left to share. Explores the Rainforest is the last proper game in the series I played. I know there are a couple others that came out in the early 2000s, but I didn't play them, so I can't cover them on this show, since they weren't part of my childhood. Despite this and dinosaurs being available in my real-life classroom back in the day, this is the one I have the fewest memories of, and I had to replay it to jog my memory a bit. This time around, you're tasked with turning the classroom into a rainforest. To do that, it's off to the Costa Rica rainforest to clone some samples, both organic and inorganic. You only get three main locations this time around, but they all have sub-locations you can visit as well, so they didn't totally skimp out on exploration. The rainforest has a nice diverse ecosystem for you to learn about, and you'll learn all about it as you look for samples. Like dinosaurs, you get a few clues for what you're looking for and where to find it. But, as is the case with the other games, you don't need to explore everywhere if you're just going for the main objective, and in my first test run, I found everything I needed without even leaving the understory. If you discount the time spent poking around for the sake of poking around, I filled the kit in less than five minutes. I admit, that was cathartic to pull off, seeing as I never actually beat this game as a kid, but it felt a little anticlimactic to be done so quickly. Oh well, at least the charm is still there. Maybe that's why I'm going so easy on these games. They may not be perfect, but you can tell a lot of heart was put into them. It's the same reason we all give LEGO Island a pass, despite it being so bare-bones from a gameplay standpoint. I still click around and interact with the environment, hoping to learn more or to witness something funny happen. I still do the experiments and play the games, watching Darwin have his way with a basilisk who didn't get the memo on evolution. I was still fascinated with the delicate balance of a frog being big and loud enough to attract mates, but not so big that he couldn't rest on a leaf, and not so loud that he'd attract unwanted attention. And these animated segments are still mildly amusing. Education systems the world over could take a page out of this collection's book. Learning doesn't have to be boring. No matter how many times I beat these games or fail to find anything, I kept coming back. I can't really say the same for the Mars Activity Center, though. There were a few of these activity centers, and while they had some neat stuff, there wasn't much to write home about. Probably the best thing about this game is the rover builder, which itself is super limited. All you really get out of it is why rovers usually run on at least six wheels, and why solar power, while imperfect, is still superior to battery power. You're not getting that rover back, after all. I don't care how many billions of dollars you think you have to your name. We are not getting humans on Mars to replace those batteries anytime soon. Otherwise, this activity center, much like the others I imagine, is a very short-lived, one-and-done deal. You can see everything there is to see in about half an hour, if even that. Put it this way, 
You could see and do everything in the Mars Activity Center twice in the time it's taken you to get to this point in the video. Because holy crap, this is one long video and my throat is killing. But this is about every Magic School Bus game that I own. And I do own it, so it's worth a mention at least. So that's my Magic School Bus collection. I am aware that I'm leaving out two other games and a few activity centers, but I don't have those, so they don't qualify for the toy box. In conclusion, these games still hold a special place in my heart. I owe my adoration of geology and marine life to them. That's about as high as praise can get as far as I'm concerned. I'll be first to admit they're imperfect. Some of them are a little light on encouraging engagement with their educational aspects, and you can straight up brute force some of these if you really want. But they did a much better job of making learning fun than 3001 did. It sure doesn't hurt that the only fail states are in the minigames. If you didn't get everything, you can always come back another time, pick up where you left off, take a break. And if you care enough, you can learn from these games. I'm a grown man and I still walked away smarter for playing these again. My copy of Explores the Ocean is straight up battle scarred. Well, to be fair, that's mainly because I was very bad at keeping these discs in their jewel cases, but still. These games are a big part of who I am today. They made a lasting impression, and I can't help but pay my respects. So to Joanna Cole, Bruce Degan, and all the devs at Music Pen, thanks for the memories.